Hey guys, so Friday afternoon at the end of two days, um, it's, it's an interesting time to come on. Um, I'll try not to repeat a bunch of things that you heard and if I do, um, I apologize. But if I do repeat any of the things that James said, I don't apologize because there were excellent points and uh, worth making again um, a couple of times. There won't be as much data, it'll be mainly conceptual. Um, stay with me. This is a chart that always, I guess you've seen it at various points in various forms, but it always um, is, is super stark. So when I look at this, uh, let me figure out how, ah, okay. Look at this, this space, right? Um, people over the age of 65 plus as compared to people below the age of five. And I don't need to say too much more, right? I mean, look, think about the burden this is placing on the healthcare systems. We all know the amount of healthcare that's consumed by people over the age of 65. And now you have a smaller base which is able to support this burden. Now, how do you address this? There are two ways. One, you reduce the amount of healthcare that the people over 65 are consuming. Second, you increase the amount of productivity that the people over 65 are able to bring into the system. Yeah. So there are two, two, two ways in which people are looking at this. And for me, I'll put this in two categories. One is people are investing in devices and technology which allow people over 65 to function better, which is they're able to do their everyday jobs and be more productive. Yeah? The second piece is more on the biology. And that's the area that I'm going to talk about now, which, is, which I think you've seen a little bit over the last couple of days as well. Um, and how much of investment is going into that area, right? And this, this, is, this just sort of shows the amount of um, renewed interest, or should I say, um, a lot of interest over the last few years in um, aging and in longevity. A lot of this is going into the devices and the technologies that I mentioned. And a few visionary investors are also investing in the biology of aging. But how much of this is coming from Big Pharma? How much of this is coming from some of the um, regular biotech investors that you would think of, the Orbimeds, the Atlas, the Third Rocks, and so forth? Practically, very little. And now, let me, let me think about where these guys are investing their dollars, right? It's not like they're not investing in diseases which are related to age. So if you take cardiovascular disease, there's cancer, there's dementia, other neurodegenerative disease, there's a lot of investment going in there. But there's not enough investment going into the root cause of these diseases, which is aging, which is what this entire group and all of these seminars have been focused on, right? And what's the reason for that? And what I want to focus on today is how do you galvanize more investment into these approaches or the hallmarks of aging as you've been hearing and how do you sustain this? How do you build an R&D model which makes sense for, an aging, for aging research as opposed to the typical biotech model? The issue here is that when you think about aging, it's not just one disease. It's a bundle of diseases, and there are many mechanisms associated with it. So it's not enough to have um, investments in two or three areas which are disparate investments. You need to find a way in which all of these biological mechanisms come together and you're able to leverage the interconnectedness among them. So it's sort of a matrix problem and it's going to need a matrix solution. And I'll, I'll play with this a little bit, right? And just bear with me. Let's dig deep a little bit into the incentives of a traditional biotech VC and also a traditional pharma company. And if I start with the VC model, in most cases, these are disparate investments. You have a portfolio of four or five companies which are focused on specific diseases. Technically, the, these companies could be focused on various approaches as well. But these investments are separate they don't necessarily leverage each other in terms of science. It's hard to move IP between these investments. It's hard to move data between these investments. In addition, the time frame from a VC model is much smaller than it is for a pharma company. So a VC 
which is successful still needs a pharma company towards the end of it in order to be a feeder. Um, the other piece now, let's talk a little bit about pharma, right? And pharma is able to actually leverage the different investments it makes, since it all rests within the same umbrella and should be able to leverage the interconnectedness, should be able to move IP across, the, uh, across their investments. But why doesn't it happen so much? Now, if I worked with a pharma company for many years, I advised pharma companies for many years, but when you think about pharma, most of their units, the research units they have, are built around disease areas. So how do you take a cardiovascular disease research unit and you have an oncology research unit and you tell them you need to collaborate and then leverage the interconnectedness. These are people with specific disease area expertise who have models focused on that disease area. They don't know how to collaborate, right? So that's the problem that pharma faces. In addition, pharma is not really playing in the very early risky cutting edge sites. What they would prefer is to have the VCs do the de-risking for them and then play at a later stage when the asset is de-risked, when they see enough efficacy in an animal model, when they see human data, and so on and so forth, right? So what would be, what, what's, what, how, do we, how do we solve this, right? If we can, can we get the best of both worlds? So what, we're, what I'm asking for here is someone who has a longish time frame, whose investors are super patient, who can take on a huge amount of risk, basically the best of everything that you can think of, but that does not exist. So a couple of things that I'm trying to do, and that's what I'm going to talk about when, we, uh, when I talk about the life biosciences model, is we're trying to take two things out. One, the risk. How do you reduce the risk that we're playing with through a portfolio approach? And second, within this portfolio approach, how do you leverage the interconnectedness of the approaches um, towards aging? So Life Biosciences is a biotech company. We're invested in multiple approaches, um, which are the hallmarks of aging as you know them. The difference uh, between what we do and what a pharma company does is our units or platforms are not based on diseases. We're technically disease agnostic. We are investing in autophagy. We're investing in senescence, we're investing in uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, we're investing in uh, cellular reprogramming. So we have all of these platforms. Each of these could potentially be working on the same disease. I can potentially go at a certain age-related disease across, from three approaches. Yeah? And it's easier for us to collaborate across these because um, we're looking to find we, I could have a single disease, let's say it's uh, uh, for, for, for reason of convenience, I'll take um, uh, age-related macular degeneration. And I can find um, uh, ways to leverage the expertise across three of these approaches in the same disease and bring in disease experts who are focused on the disease, but they're working with the uh, uh, academic founders in each of these areas. The other thing that we're able to do is for all of these approaches, we have a centralized function which is driving most of our development and business, et cetera, which is not focused in each of the research units. As opposed to when I'm thinking about um, portfolio of investments in a VC company, um, in, a, in a VC, I would be looking at building a bunch of capabilities in each of our portfolio companies, and that I'm not looking to do. It's all set up in the center. Right. And how do we do this? And how, I spoke about two things. Right? One, I spoke about the interconnectedness, and second thing I spoke about is reducing risk. One way to reduce risk is can we pick the top signs that we can find in each of these approaches? And that's what we started with. We identified some of the key scientists in each of these areas that we wanted to bring into our fold. Um, some of the names here um, and the pictures, you, you'll probably recognize them. We have Manuel Serrano, who's working with us on the senescent side, David Sinclair, Nir Basila, and Ana Maria Cuervo in Einstein, um, Ana Maria with, the, with her Selfagy, which is a rotophagy um, platform, Steve Horvath of The Clock, and uh, Juan Carlos, who's, uh, who's our cellular reprogramming expert. These folks have already worked with each other at some point or the other. What we've done now is within our platform, we've created a um, more company kind of an environment where they 
continue to collaborate, continue to drive the science that they're doing. But what we're providing at the center is the pharma capabilities, the development expertise, and the regulatory expertise to take their science and move it forward, um, bringing it to uh, translate it into therapeutics, right? One of the things that we're also doing um, with each of these academics is they're not coming in and becoming founders or, or, or regular employees of the companies or, or, or of life biosciences. They continue with what they're doing in their environment because this environment and the networks is what make them, makes them the most productive. One of the things that I've seen in pharma is a lot of times you have research unit heads who are coming in from straight from academia. Running an academic lab is not the same as running a research unit in a pharma company. It's a completely different skill set. It requires a lot of logistics. It requires a lot of detail, which is more to do with management than actual science. And that's not what we want to do. We want to make sure that the folks who are best equipped to do the science are in their environment, which excites them, and they're able to continue doing the innovative science. But we will bring in the right people in order to do, who will be managing the development process and the regulatory, like I said. And this is a little bit of what I just spoke, right? And I said, how do we reduce the risk overall? We have a diversified portfolio. We have a portfolio of different approaches. They're all, a bunch of these approaches can potentially be targeting the same disease. And the way I reduce risk for our investors is these multiple approaches with uncorrelated risk, basically targeting one or two key areas of strong, of high unmet need. I spoke a little bit about bringing in a team, which is ex pharma, which understands development, which has gone through regulatory, people who brought drugs to market. And that, I think, is super key when you're talking about a new area. And when we talk about aging, we're talking about longevity, new concepts. Um, one of the things that I always find, and I made this point in previous um, meetings, is there's very few people from pharma that I see in these meetings. Very few people, and I think I heard this point made a little while ago, who actually taken drugs to development, to, who have taken drugs to market. So what, for us, it was key to bring in folks who spent 20 years or more in pharma who understand what it means to evaluate science which translates into therapeutics and then take them to market, right? I'm not going to go through each one of them, but you, you had a chance to look from the starting from R&D to business, uh, legal, and technology. We pulled together what I would say a top team at the center, which works with the scientists that we spoke about before. And I'll sort of end here and I'll take questions, but the, I'll leave you with three things, right? We wanted to build a model which does, which makes sense for all of the key stakeholders in the ecosystem. If I look at academics, uh, this gives them an opportunity to advance their cutting edge science. They don't need to change their working environment. They continue to leverage the connections that they have and the relationships that they have. Um, for investors, we're working in an area of large, significant, unmet need. But at the same time, we're providing a diverse portfolio approach, a diverse portfolio approach with uncorrelated risk. For pharma, they recognize where we're coming from. We're following the same processes, that we're, we have the same relationships. So we're driven on rigorous scientific um, data. So we're, we see them as our logical partners. Take, for example, if we're working on an orphan disease, we probably look to be able to drive it all the way through phase three. But if we have, uh, if we're working on NASH or if we're working on Parkinson's, we would be looking at a pharma partner for our later stage trials. Um, and we want to make sure that what we're doing makes sense to pharma and is attractive to them. So I'll just, I'll stop. It's sort of been a um, long two days. Um, I'll keep this one short and take questions. <laughs>